So, uh, I'd like to introduce Sarah Amick, who's a consultant paediatric neurologist from Great Ormond Street, and she will be talking about um, mitochondrial disease and epilepsy. Okay, thank you, Alison. Um, I'm just going to move over here a bit so you can see um, what's important. Thank you very much for asking me to speak. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all. Um, so I'm a consultant with the Complex Epilepsy Service at Great Ormond Street and also with the Neurodisability Team. <coughs> So I'm going to cover, um, talking just a bit about the background of epilepsy, some of background about anti-epileptic drugs, um, cannabidiol, which is very topical at the moment, um, a little bit about the ketogenic diet, and something about catamenial epilepsy, which is to do with changes with epilepsy with the menstrual cycle, which um, was a request. Um, I'm going to suggest I take questions at the end, if that's all right, just to try and get through all this. Um, so just as a starting point, what do we mean by epilepsy and what is a seizure? So a seizure essentially means there's, um, there's actually a burst of synchronous electrical activity in the brain and we can pick that up on an EG here. So here you can see all those spikes occurring, that's where a seizure's happening. And this leads to symptoms or signs depending where the seizure starts and where it spreads to. Epilepsy is normally defined as at least two seizures occurring um, more than 24 hours apart, or one seizure, and at least a 60% probability of a further seizure occurring over the next 10 years. So it means if you have an underlying brain problem, it may be you only have one seizure, but because the risk of a further seizure is very high, a diagnosis would be given of epilepsy. So what causes seizure activity? And actually it's quite helpful to think fairly simplistically about um, a balance between the excitatory and inhibitory chemicals within the brain. And the excitatory um, neurotransmitter, glutamate, um, is, this is the main excitatory neurotransmitter, inhibitory is GABA. So it's a bit of a yin and yang situation. And also you can think about the change in the stability of the surface of the neurons here in terms of the balance of things like calcium and sodium. And there's a relationship um, normally between these things. So just to take you a little bit, um, how do we think about seizures from the neurological point of view? So we think in terms of whether seizures are generalised. So it means they're actually they're arising um, within networks, um, which are more general networks, and spreading really rapidly across those. And there are different seizures, which are generalised seizures, um, some of which you'll be familiar with. Tonic-clonic, most people have seen someone stiffening and then having bilateral limb jerks. Blank spells, clonic um, jerking, tonic stiffening episodes, or atonic, where they lose tone. And then myoclonic, which are quite common in um, mitochondrial disorders, which are jerks. And then there can be different sorts of absences. In terms of focal seizures, it means that they're originating in networks in one area or in one side of the brain. And they are, they are then sort of looked at according to the features that go with them. So it might be there's a confusional state or there's jerking of one limb. So rather than spreading across the brain initially, they're starting one area. But they can lead to a more generalised seizure where you go into that tonic-clonic seizure. So in mitochondrial disease, what are the possible factors that lead to epilepsy being such a common problem? And um, looking at this, you know, I think there is essentially a positive research, really. Um, but it's thought that energy failure, um, the reactive oxygen species, which you've been hearing about, um, are a factor. There might be abnormal calcium handling. There might be increased program loss of brain cells, apoptosis. And there might sometimes acutely, if someone's acutely be, uh, ill, be imbalances of sodium, for instance, um, or problems because of kidney function that, that can predispose to seizures. So there might be multiple factors occurring. And actually there are probably not enough studies really looking at how common this is, and particularly in relation dif to different mitochondrial conditions. So studies broadly come up with um, seizures in between about 35 to 60 percent of people with biochemically confirmed mitochondrial disease. And what we do know, though, is unfortunately epilepsy is often very difficult to treat and falls into that group um, where we're um, having difficulty fully controlling seizures. So we do definitely need more research looking at this area. 
In terms of epilepsy um, occurring in mitochondrial diseases in childhood, the, um, these are the more common conditions associated with epilepsy, and some of these, um, the epilepsy is particularly Sorry. difficult, so for instance, an Alpers um, disease or Lee syndrome. And in children, um, we tend to see these seizure types. So in infants, we might see a particular type of epilepsy called infantile spasms. And the reason for recognising this is it has a specific treatment approach to it. So when we're seeing um, children with epilepsy, we need to be thinking about the different seizure types and whether it falls within a kind of pattern recognition of one type of epilepsy because it might inform our treatment. Um, and more commonly in children than adults, there seem to be focal seizures, seizures arising from areas um, and spreading. Rather, in adults, it seems seizures are more commonly generalised at the start. Myoclonic epilepsy is particularly common, as I've mentioned, and also this condition called epilepsia partialis continua, EPC for short, essentially it means that you get recurrent um, jerks of the limbs, sometimes the mouth, and they're exacerbated by movement, the person retains awareness, and that's another common condition in mitochondrial conditions. And also we can have quite commonly recurrent status epilepticus, that means seizures last for 30 minutes um, or longer, or there's recurrent seizures over 30 minutes without full recovery, and status epilepticus is, is a medical emergency. So in adulthood, more commonly those associated with an onset of epilepsy in adulthood, amelus, labors hereditary optic nerve neuropathy, um, NARP, and this, this condition as well. Um, so it's a little bit of a different picture from children. So what about medication? What can we do? And how do these work? So um, as I've explained, um, we understand something about the mechanisms and there's a huge amount of research going on in the epilepsy field to understand mechanisms of seizure generation and therefore to have treatments that are much more targeted at the cause of seizures. And um, so we can think about treatments that might um, stabilise this abnormal firing of electrical activity that's going on that might alter that excitatory inhibitory neurotransmitter balance, so reset that. Some of the drugs um, have several ways of working, but what we can see is there's a lack of drug trials specifically in mitochondrial conditions. And in fact, over the years, there's really been a lack of trials in paediatric epilepsy, although that's now improving. So this is just a, a, a diagram to show you some of the range of treatments. And you'll see here a number of um, different medications listed. And just giving you an idea that there is a bit of a rationale about how they work and how we might think about using them. And sometimes it's think, it helpful to think about combining medications that work in a different way, um, because perhaps you might get something that's synergistic. So some of the newer medicines we're using, or relatively new, Trastam, um, parampanil, which is one of the newer drugs we're using in children, um, which acts to decrease glutamate. And then there are a range of drugs like uh, lamotrigine and topiramate that have been um, around for you know, a long time. But there's a lot of research going on to develop new treatments and try and make them more specific to the epilepsy and avoid side effects because they're acting sometimes quite broadly in the brain. So how do we think about treatment? So uh, when we see children with epilepsy, there are a number of factors we need to consider with the parents and young person. And first of all, what kind of seizure types are happening? Um, and there might be a range of drugs that might be applicable for those particular seizure types. Um, there might be individual factors that might affect how well that medication is tolerated. And it might be to do with other medications the child is receiving. Um, or for instance, in mitochondrial disease, it could be other factors that's affecting the child um, in other um, ways that their body is affected. So we also have to think carefully about interactions. In mitochondrial conditions, we would think about drugs with what are thought to be a low mitochondrial toxic, toxic potential, so levetrastam, lamotrigine. In fact, we don't use gabapentin really now for seizures because it wasn't particularly effective. But we do use anisomides, and I, I think, as far as I know, parampanil could also be used. But there are undoubtedly drugs that have a higher toxic potential, and certainly valproic acid, sodium valproate is one we avoid, carbamazepine, 
Um, there are some concerns about phenytoin and phenobarbital, but they are often used for emergency treatment. Sorry, can I ask a question? Um, this is probably a really yeah. stupid question, but what do you mean by mitochondrial toxic potential? Mm. The reason I'm asking yeah. is my sons on carbon has been okay. listed there. Okay, so I think it's a relative. I think it's a relative concern rather than a, um, you know, and it will probably depend on the condition. Um, but you and know, the other one's clobazam, and I haven't yes. seen this listed at all. So clobazam, I don't think there's any concern about in okay. terms of affecting mitochondrial. So, and it's a relative issue as well. It doesn't mean that every child can't have um, phenobarbital and phenytoin. Just what do you mean by toxic yeah. potential? So um, that would be, I suppose, what they're alluding to is whether it affects function. But probably I need to ask one of my colleagues who's best, you know, specifically work in mitochondria about that. So what about treatment of epilepsy and goals? So many of the children I look after um, with epilepsy, we're thinking about unfortunately not being able to stop the epilepsy completely, but we're thinking about how can we optimise quality of life and thinking about that balance between benefit of treatment and possible adverse effects. And what we need to do is look at those goals individually with, with the family um, and think about what's realistic. So um, if we can reduce severity of seizures and frequency, we might make a difference for that child. And importantly, we need to avoid adverse effects of treatment because these medicines can have a range of side effects. Um, and that can be partly related to an individual response, partly related to dose, and partly related to co-medication. So it's really important we think about that balance. And um, also, when we're thinking about this, there are, in NICE guidance, it says really that this needs to be discussed fully um, with the patient or family. So there should be a lot of discussion about what people feel is, is the right way forward together with the doctor. So I'm going to move now to talk about cannabidiol, which um, obviously has been very high profile recently. And um, you know, I think a lot of patients are asking whether this is a treatment that might help them or um, help their child. So um, cannabis and treatment for epilepsy. So it has been recognized by various cases and case series that um, cannabis derivatives can have an anti-epileptic effect. And um, a lot of this um, sort of came initially from the US, where people were starting to use this quite often, um, uh, not you know without prescription. So if we look at um, cannabis, the main um, main psychoactive component is THC, and that's the ingredient if people um, use recreational cannabis that gives that sort of high um, effect, and it's also associated with. Um, with um, long-term um, <coughs> concerns about psychosis and addiction. So generally, we we have some concerns about using that therapeutically, um, certainly in, for children. Um, cannabidiol is the most um, abundant non-psychoactive component in cannabis. And there have been a number of animal studies that have shown anticonvulsant effects. Um, and um, we can see, it was seen then that it was helpful to go down this route to, <coughs> to develop this treatment for epilepsy. Um, so mostly, um, cannabis and THC reduce seizure activity, but occasionally in some animals have increased seizure activity. The, the balance has been in favor of certainly cannabidiol has been useful for epilepsy. So what's the current position? Because um, I think it's been quite confusing and um, there can be, um, you know, people want to access treatment that's helpful for their child and then different countries have different guidelines around this and different legislation. So in terms of the UK, um, cannabidiol products are legal if they have less than 0.2% THC. And if they have more than 0.2% THC, they are illegal unless they're licensed and authorised for use. So there might be some of the products used in other adult neurological conditions that perhaps have that. But they have to have been approved by um, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority. Um, and therefore, if we're going to use um, medication, we need to have demonstrated safety and benefit in a well-designed randomized study. And usually that's comparing the treatment with a dummy treatment, um, and ideally 
neither the patients nor the person assessing knows which they're receiving at the time, so it's really objective as to whether there's improvement. So this is the, you know, the standard that's expected in terms of looking at um, medication and whether it's then licensed. So what then might be confusing is there are various oils that can be purchased um, you know, in health food shops or online, and you know, what do they actually have in them? So we can't always be sure, basically. So they don't necessarily have quality assurance testing. So you might buy something in a, healthcare, a health um, food shop that says it has cannabidiol, but you don't really know how much. And you might not know how much THC is in it. And in fact, it could be very little. It might just be it's not going to be effective at all. Or perhaps it could have more THC, which might be a concern. So there's just varying levels of these, basically. And um, you know, that's why, um, at the moment, um, there's concern about people using these. Um, and currently, doctors are not able to prescribe these within our code of practice. So we can't just be given an oil from a shop and say, we'll, we'll prescribe that, because we're not allowed to. So what's been happening then? So GW Pharma have been doing trials. And I'll show you two trials that have recently been done. And um, they, um, these have cannabidiol and less than 0.1% THC. And they have done two trials, one in Dravet syndrome and one in lennox gastel syndrome. They're both specific kinds of epilepsy in children which are very resistant to treatment. Um, and they have shown positive results. So at the moment, um, this data from those trials is with regulatory authorities. So in the US, they're likely to approve that very soon. In Europe stroke UK, we're waiting for approval, which will probably be later this year. So this was the study which was done um, looking at lennox gastel syndrome. Um, and this was multi-center and um, included, um, these studies have included patients from Great Ormond Street. So this just shows you the reduction in drop seizures. So patients with lennox gastel very often have seizures that make them fall suddenly to the ground. And um, what you can see here is a reduction of um, these are the dummy patients who haven't had treatment compared to the active treatment. You can see a reduction um, in the treatment period and then when they continued that was greater with this treatment. Adverse effects with cannabidiols that are diarrhea, sleepiness, temperature, decreased appetite, vomiting. Um, so they're all, you know, they're all possible. The second trial for Dravet syndrome um, was carried out, um, again, multi-centre. My colleague Helen Cross was involved in this. And again, what we can see, if we look at um, cannabidiol and the dummy placebo group, we can see that there's a bigger percentage change in seizures, reduction in cannabidiol <coughs> compared to the dummy group. Again, similar side effects tummy symptoms, tiredness, um, some concern about um, infections. Um, but overall, you know, they, they can be tolerated, but there are people who get side effects. So at the moment, we're waiting for this to be available to, to prescribe. So I'm just going to turn <coughs> quickly to talk about some aspects of the ketogenic diet. And um, may, many of you may know that these are diets in which there's a level of fat to produce ketosis, which mimics starvation, um, and fat is increased. We have a decrease in other aspects of the diet, so um, we have a decrease in carbohydrates and protein, which are very controlled. And therefore, energy is coming from the ketone bodies, which, is, which are produced. So there are just different sorts of diet, ratios of fat, um, using medium chain triglycerides, um, um, at modified Atkins diet, which is more protein and carbohydrate. So there are different sorts of diets. And essentially, they are looking at how much um, the ratio is of fat to, to protein. There are feeds that can also be given. And there's a classical diet where you adapt the diet with with normal um, natural foods, or you can have an MCT diet where supplements are used. So um, this is just a review of studies which were done, have been done over time. And generally what you can see, if you look at greater than 50% seizure reduction, 
you can see a benefit of the diet, 38% here, 52% here, 50% here, and a smaller number who actually had a greater than 90% seizure, um, seizure reduction, and um, in some cases a few 5 to 10% who were seizure free. Actually, the diet um, performs in a similar way to all anti-epileptic drugs if you look at the numbers that achieve response, and that's similar for cannabidiol. So none of these treatments seem to be better than each other. <coughs> side effects, um, commonly tummy side effects, nausea, vomiting, you can get renal stones, you can have weight loss and inadequate growth and raised lipids. So I need to emphasise this diet is only managed by a dietitian who is trained to manage the ketogenic diet, and it's managed by a team of people working together because um, it's not, not something that should be embarked on without that specialist advice to ensure adequate growth of the child, adequate calories, um, and um, you know, monitoring and adjusting carefully. So when would we consider seizures that are resistant to treatment? Um, there are some metabolic disorders, so glucose transporter and um, PD, pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency, where we would think about the diet. When wouldn't we use it? Again, there are some metabolic conditions where we wouldn't use it. And there might be some contraindications, so children who aren't going to tolerate the diet um, because they, they won't take it, or um, sometimes if they've got problems with reflux. But actually children who are fed by tube, it can work very well um, because it can be easily delivered. So there are, lots, there are hypotheses about how this works, and originally it was thought it was just around sort of ketone bodies um, and how this may alter um, neurotransmitters, so favoring, favoring more of the inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And also some evidence that there are some neuroprotective effects, so some protections to the brain and some suggestions there might be improvement in mitochondrial function. Um, and people are thinking about whether it could be used in other wider neurological conditions. So more recently, people have been looking at decanoic acid, which is one of the um, polyunsaturated fats in the ketogenic diet. And there is some evidence it can increase the number and function of mitochondrion cells. And more recently, there's been research carried out at the Royal Holloway um, with um, Matthew Walker at the National Hospital showing that it actually blocks one of these receptors in the brain, the AMPA receptor. Um, and they're now trying a trial to see whether they could just give dacanoic acid rather than go through the whole diet um, course to see if that actually helps epilepsy. So that's in progress. Um, this is a very small study I found looking at KD for mitochondrial disorders. And it was really a range of people with different conditions and a range of outcomes, really. Um, so seven patients became seizure-free. Um, and, um, you know, there were some improvements, um, but there really, um, again, there aren't proper trials in, in mitochondrial disorders. There is a um, series, retrospective series, looking backwards at patients who've had this for um, PDH deficiency, and this is a Swedish study where they look back at their patients, and they had 19 patients, um, most had um, prenatal onset disease, they've been treated with a diet for a meeting of two, nearly three years, and they were all um, still alive um, in terms of follow-up, so they'd all continued. And there were other positive effects of the diet besides the epilepsy, so um, unsteadiness, ataxia, sleep disturbance, and um, development and social functioning. One patient had pancreatitis, otherwise it was well tolerated. The mean, uh, median plasma concentration of ketones was around three and what they found is for where um, compliance was poorer, there seemed to be an impact on outcomes. So this um, diagram looks at um, the age at start of the diet um, and the age um, at follow-up here in pale blue, so that's age at start. And the bars represent the motor development. And you can see in some cases, you know, there was quite a um, sort of looked like a, a more, perhaps a more rapid development, others were a bit static, so there was a variable outcome, um, but some suggestions, some children did benefit from that point of view. And then this looks at parents' impression of um, improvement looking at motor, cognitive, social and epilepsy. So the dark blue is very much improved, then you've got uh, much improved and um, minimally improved. And it gives, it gives you an idea that there were um, seem to be overall improvements in, in a number of people.
So I'm just going to finish off for five minutes, if that's okay. Sorry, I can't see your, your form from there. Anyway, five minutes on catamenial epilepsy. So I was asked to mention this because there are some um, women, um, adolescents, who get a takeoff of their epilepsy with periods. So it means that there's a cyclical change in their periods, uh, in the epilepsy with their period happening. And um, there's been quite a lot of research on this, looking at the patterns of this. And one of the common patterns is over the period of time that someone is menstruating. So this pattern has been called C1. So it's basically um, over just before the period starts to three days into the period. There's also a pattern where it can be coinciding with ovulation. And then there are people who don't have ovulation, but so they have a sort of abnormal cycle. And then they can have quite a long period of increase in seizures. So these diagrams are showing you the different patterns um, of periods and takeoff of seizures. So if you look at this diagram up here, what you've got is the estrogen component in the blue, showing what we normally expect in a cycle where you're ovulating. You get um, a peak of um, estrogen with ovulation, um, a slight fall, and then a decrease as you go into your period. The pink is the progesterone. Again, here you can see it building up um, and then falling. And then in this one, you've got someone who's not ovulating, and you can see that there's a sort of higher, uh, well, a persistent rise in, in estrogen, and progesterone is kind of staying at a lower level. Um, so people have really looked at um, the associations and have documented that there are certainly people where they get this takeoff in seizures in these different patterns. <coughs> Um, so what could we do about that? So there is a study that looked at giving progesterone around that premenstrual exacerbation and found that there was a reduction in seizures. Um, and that was for the progesterone lozenges they used. They found it wasn't effective for women with other patterns related to their periods. And it wasn't generally um, effective for epilepsy if they didn't have any pattern of epilepsy with their, with their periods. Um, so there's cyclic progesterone treatment I've just talked about. Sometimes it's helpful to actually stop menstruation, give um, long acting um, progesterone, which is given by injection, often three monthly. So that stops the cyclic change occurring. I think one of the concerns about that might be it could affect bone density. Um, another approach might be just to give the oral contraceptive pill, which again stops you ovulating and keeps things more to level. Sometimes we use clobazam, which can be helpful. If we know if someone has a very regular cycle, you can give it a few days before their period, say for three or five days, and that, that can be helpful as a short course. Some people have used a drug called acetylolamide, but there isn't really evidence supporting that. So in summary, um, we, can, we, we can see that treatment of epilepsy with mitochondrial disorders can be difficult. And undoubtedly, there's a need for much more research um, looking at the different underlying conditions and um, how we might tackle that. There is a role for the ketogenic diet, I think, more broadly in mitochondrial disease and specifically for PDH deficiency. But I think what's, um, you know, what's optimistic is there's a huge amount of research in epilepsy um, looking at basic science and looking at treatments. And we can also see for some people that treating their menstrual takeoff can be helpful. So I'd just like to acknowledge colleagues who have given me some contributions, particularly Chris Nelts, who gave me some of the KD slides. Okay, thank you. <laughs>